We would like to welcome everyone to uh, another edition of our Orthodox Bible study. Uh, we are continuing in our study of the uh, Gospel of St. Matthew. And uh, as, we, uh, as is our custom, let us begin with the offering of the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O Master, who loves mankind, illumine our hearts with the pure light of the divine knowledge of your gospel. Open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon the spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and unto you we give glory, together with your eternal Father, your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. We are in the Gospel of St. Matthew, uh, and we're going to begin the 11th chapter. Those of you who have the uh, Orthodox Study Bible, is page 1,287. We talked about in the past the entrance of Christ and with him the entrance of the kingdom of heaven and the power and effect of that entrance of the kingdom uh, that is seen in the various miracles that are performed as well in uh, the excellent teaching uh, that is given by the Lord. And all of these things preparing us to be able to receive uh, the fullness of that kingdom. That begins now. It begins now. And uh, it will be completed in the eschaton, uh, the end of time or the, the, uh, the final day when God will come in his glory. This past Thursday, we celebrated the feast of the Annunciate, uh, the pe feast of the uh, Ascension, was a sin in, and um, uh, very profound was that gospel from Luke, uh, when the angels were came as the Lord ascended into the heavens bodily to be enthroned at the right hand of the Father to receive the glory that was due Him. Uh, the angels say to the apostles who are looking up to heaven, why are you looking up to heaven? Because the same Lord who has ascended will come down the same way. But this time he will come with power and glory and authority. So therefore we prepare ourselves for that second coming. We begin the gospel, uh, the, the 11th chapter of the gospel, with uh, the uh, reference being made to St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist is proclaimed by the church as the forerunner. Uh, he is the one uh, who has prepared the way. He has the one who has prepared the way for the coming of Christ. Uh, it was a pious belief of the Jews that before the Messiah would come that God would send back Elijah. If you remember if we play Bible trivia right now uh, whenever we used to go on a trip in the car and um, we used to play games uh, my children used to like to play trivia games. You ask a question and if you answer then you get then you answer properly then you get the answer uh, ask the next question and one time I asked who were the two people in the Old Testament that never died to which my children screamed out dad you're cheating <laughs> <laughs> uh, the two people who never died is Enoch uh, it simply says in the Old Testament that Enoch uh, walked with the Lord and he was no more and the other one is Elijah, because if you remember from the Book of Kings, uh, it was Elijah who uh, it was escorted into uh, the heavens by way of the fiery chariot. And um, it was a custom or a pious belief 
that when the Messiah would come, that Elijah would come back and that Elijah would prepare uh, for the coming of this Messiah. Although John the Baptist himself does not take the identity or claim specifically uh, that he is, the, uh, is, is Elijah, who has come, uh, come back, uh, although the Lord very specifically refers to him as Elijah, who is to come back. If you remember from the stories of, uh, that are recorded in the Book of Kings in the Old Testament, we hear the story of Elijah, who is a very rough, a very kind of crude person, uh, who was known for his, his exemplary strength, his ecstatic uh, energy, and uh, he would want to be one who would be able to be in one place and then into another place and uh, boldly proclaiming God's word. Uh, he was persecuted by the king of Israel, Jezebel. Uh, he uh, was uh, the one who was the ideal ascetic. Uh, the one who dedicated himself to, to prayer and to fasting. And we see in the image of John the Baptist that same type of personality. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember thinking to myself, even as a child reading this, or, or a young boy reading this, that if we were to look at the face of John the Baptist, we would probably see, uh, to use modern term, like a cloning, if you will, of, uh, of uh, Elijah. Uh, we see uh, the Baptist portrayed in the, the camel hair that he's described with the leather belt. In fact, uh, many uh, Eastern Orthodox monks uh, to this day wear that leather belt with the buckle with the cross and the, the, the prayer that is offered on it. And uh, the scripture tells that he ate what locust and wild honey and fasted. Uh, he was the uh, monk, if you will. And his preaching was to repent, for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And now we turn back to this preaching of John, and uh, we uh, come to this in this 11th chapter. Let us now continue chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass that when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Remember prior, uh, Jesus gives the instruction and he sends them out, you know, two by two with particular instructions. And when John had heard in prison, at this time he was arrested. Uh, if you remember the story of the Baptist uh, that we uh, find in the Gospel uh, of, uh, I think it's Luke, I can't remember, uh, but uh, we have the story of the Baptist who, uh, because of his audacious uh, style of preaching, uh, angered Herod Herod's uh, wife, Herodias, and as a result is sent in prison, and of course later uh, is beheaded uh, because of the dance of, her, uh, of the, her daughter, and who asked for the head of John the Baptist on the platter. Uh, so therefore he is in prison at this particular time. And he heard in prison about the works of Christ, and he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the, the coming one, or do we look for another? I remember being a young boy and thinking to myself, if John were such a, a powerful prophet, and was Elijah, who was, to me was uh, unshakable in his strength. Why does he send the disciple, his disciples and why does he ask this question? Well, there are some fathers of the early church that say that he sends uh, not because he disbelieves, but he sends the disciples to Jesus uh, in order for them to be able to believe. Uh, and also uh, it is a means of strengthening even the faith of the Baptist. Uh, one of the things that the scripture did and the preaching did in the early church, whenever the first century Christians read these works, 
not only was it a means of education uh, and spiritual formation, but it was also a, a means of bolstering our faith. That's one of the main reasons why we go to church, too, and even why we receive the Eucharist. Uh, it is food, it is drink for our spiritual nourishment and our spiritual strength, as you see. So, uh, therefore, um, uh, it is a means of strengthening even the faith of the, of the Baptist himself. Uh, it was believed, uh, uh, according to prophetic teaching, uh, centuries before, that the coming age of the Messiah, or the age of the Messiah, would be preceded by great signs. Signs in the heavens, and a lot of times uh, this apocalyptic language was even used. And uh, it would be a, a display of power. Uh, remember our, when I told you before that with the coming of the physical Christ, as with his, physically com his physical coming, and with his teaching and preaching, uh, you know, the kingdom is 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 uh, is is charged onto the on the world uh, with great power, and that's why you have uh, such dramatic things that are happening. Uh, just like whenever two great fronts come together, high pressure, low pressure, is accompanied by lightning and thunder. You see the same type of effect. A, a dramatic thing is happening. And Jesus answers the question. Jesus answers and he says to them, that is to the two disciples of, of John, go and tell John the things which you hear and the things that you see. They were able to hear Jesus preach and they were able to see the miracles that were performed, which are in fulfillment of the, of what the prophets said would happen with the inauguration of this coming of this Son of Man. And what were the things that the disciples saw? The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf people hear, the dead are raised up and the poor receive the gospel preached to them and blessed is he who is not offended because of me you see the the signs of the coming kingdom that are witnessed by these disciples are conclusive proof of who jesus is and leads to a increase of faith and even an increase in the ability to understand who and what he is. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. He started talking about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? You know, I think that's a very profound question. What are you here for? even a question I can ask all of you today. What are you listening to this program for? What do you want? What do you go to church for? What are you looking for? Are you here to be entertained? Are you here to be amused? Are you sad and need a joke told to you? What, what is it that you need? Why are you here? And this is the same type of question that is being asked to them. You know, uh, you know what are you here for? What did you expect to see? He says, a reed shaken by the wind. Okay, these quasi-rulers and religious people who who are tossed to and fro in their teaching and their and and who who practice one thing and do another, like the Pharisees. You see. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in fine garments? No. Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. Well, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, and even more than just a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, and you'll see if you look in the 
uh, uh, in the italicized area, you look down in your in your uh, reference box. It comes from Malachi chapter three, verse one. Behold, I send a messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. You see, this is the image that John has fulfilled that he is indeed the prophetic the prophetic figure who is going who has come in order to prepare the way jesus even goes further to say assuredly i say to you, among those born of women there has not risen one greater than john the baptist but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than he. I think that's a very profound statement that although John is considered the greatest born of woman and he is such uh, even though uh, he did not hear, he did not see the things that the disciples saw, his disciples saw, still he believed, still he performed his works and they were great works. They were powerful works. They were a specific calling that was given by God in order to prepare the world for the coming of the Christ. So that those of us who are part of the kingdom can even be greater than John the Baptist. For even the least in the kingdom are even greater than he. You see? Uh, how much more able we are to be able to receive Christ and to receive that salvation that is promised by uh, the fear of him and the acceptance of him and our repentance and our baptism in his name you see uh, so that uh, there will come others who will be even greater including even the saints themselves who will be able to do even greater things than John because of their faith in Christ. If you think John is great and you hold him in the proper esteem that is due him, even greater things you will see, you see, than even the things John was able to do because of their acceptance of Christ and their, their being a part of that kingdom you see living the life of Christ and from the days of John the Baptist until now Jesus says the kingdom of heaven heaven suffers violence and he says it is the violent who take it by force there are a lot of different ways of understanding uh, this particular concept uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, interpretations of the Fathers uh, is that this is in reference to Christ himself. Because it is Christ himself who takes upon himself the cross as the ultimate sign of violence in order to destroy sin and by his death and resurrection destroy death and granting new life, you see. So, therefore, if we are to be imitators of Christ, we're going to have to be willing to suffer the same violence. It is not something that will easily be acceptable. We are called upon to be able to, to take that kingdom through the violence of our repentance, through the violence of our willingness to suffer martyrdom for the Lord. If you go into the book of Revelation and read the book of Revelation, which one day we will do as a part of our biblical studies, uh, that I promise you, uh, you will find that within the text of Revelation, the only ones that John says are assured of a place in God's kingdom are the martyrs or are the witnesses, you see? The ones who have their garments uh, soaked in the blood of the Lamb to come out pure white, you see? 
uh, these are the everyone else. You know, there, there's there's there, there's a certain uh, type of uh, reverent skepticism. I'm not saying that you know others can't be saved, or there are other means that one could be saved, but that honor and glory are given to the martyrs because they entered the kingdom by force, and they did it willingly, and they did it with love, and they did it in faith. It says to to uh, to to suffer for the sake of that kingdom, and if we are going to obtain that kingdom. Uh, even repentance itself, the fathers teach us, is a suffering of violence. And uh, to put it very, very easily, uh, if you have a bad habit, either fibbing or, or maybe using improper language, you know, you use it so long it becomes such a habit, it's hard to overcome. And I like very much what Metropolitan Nicholas, of blessed memory, Many times he used to tell me, he says, you know, Ken, sometimes you have to sit on yourself. You use your own weight against you, you see, and you've got to sit on yourself. And you work, and you suffer violence, you see. It's not something that comes, something worthwhile it's not, does not come to you easy. You know, my mother used to say, ill-gotten uh, gold is no one's gain. You see, you earn the, the, the blessings and the honors and all these different things that are given to us. For all the prophets of the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he says very plainly, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, those who are receptive will understand, you see? Tune in your ears, you see? Remember the old days where you used to have a radio? You know what that, you know what a radio is? <laughs> I'm looking at some of the younger uh, people in our audience here. Uh, you used to actually have knobs, they were called knobs, Peter. And you had to turn them and you had to turn them very carefully in order to get the station and, and one little touch of that knob would be static versus a clear station. You see? This is those who have ears to hear. Tune them in. Tune them in to be able to hear the truth. And we might even go further to say only those whose ears are attuned can hear. Only those who have faith will hear, understand, and accept. Those who do not reject See? They have not prepared themselves. But to what shall I liken this generation? And you know what? I think that generation is our generation. It's every generation. Let's not fool ourselves. We may become technically sophisticated as we look at Freddie here with his two computers and all his gadgets in order to put on this Bible study, and thank God for that. <laughs> Um, and to telecast this Bible study. Uh, but inwardly, we sin. You see? Morally, ethically, we still sin. And it's always going to be a part of us. And there's always going to be a violent act to overcome it. Okay? Uh, what shall I liken this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, He played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned for it to you, and you did not lament. This is in reference to an old children's story, uh, a rather children's game that was a part of society. Um, let, let, let me maybe put it in a different type of uh, terminology uh, and a different way of understanding. In the time when I grew up, back in the 60s in Duquesne, um, we had neighborhoods, you know, and there are a lot of places where the concept of neighborhood is very much lacking, where people don't know each other, you know. Uh, we, we had actually, I, I mean, we knew everyone from two miles down to two miles back, and all the children played together, 
and there were children in our neighborhood that were different ages. There were some older than me, some my age, many that were younger. And I remember a lot of times, you know, the older kids would get together and they're playing, they're having a great time, and, and we younger ones would come and we would want to get in on the fun, you know, say like hide and go seek, and the kids would be, the older kids would be annoyed at us. And it's okay, you know, go and hide and we'll come and find you. Here you're hiding, you're hiding. You know, no one's coming to look for you. And then it finally, da da, it finally dawns on you. They don't want you around. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of game uh, that we're talking about. And, you know, children are no different today, aren't they? You know? Uh, it, it's very hard for younger children and older children to play together because they have different interests, they have different attention spans, you know. Uh, and, and other things that differentiate. And this is what this generation is like. You know, I say to you, do one thing, and you do another. You see, you do the opposite. Or I call for one thing, and you're unwilling to do it because you're too busy playing with something else. You see. For John, Jesus said, came neither eating nor drinking. And they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Remember we talked about before when he, uh, we were talking about the bridegroom. Whenever the bridegroom is present, we don't fast. So therefore Jesus and his disciples did not fast because of the presence of, uh, presence of the Lord. He says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a wine, uh, wine bridegroom, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, we know what they're talking about, don't we? Remember we talked about Levi. We talked about Matthew just a few verses before. And we know who's saying those things. Jesus knew. But wisdom is justified by her children. Then he began to rebuke the cities of which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. He says, Woe to you, Cherozen, Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I remember when we were on retreat uh, last year, and we were coming down uh, from the Sea of Galilee, coming down uh, into uh, heading toward uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, we went through this area, and I re remember our tour guide, a Greek Orthodox man uh, by the name of Tanas, uh, he said, now this area here is this Chirozin, uh, and uh, this is the, the cities, some of the cities that Jesus cursed because uh, they did not repent, they did not receive his gospel. And he said that the people have always said, that because of that curse and the lack of repentance, the only thing there was literally uh, dirt and rocks. Remember? I mean, for my, you look all the way around and all you saw is dirt and stones and rocks. No, no gardens, no fields, you see. And it, the local people say, this, this is because they rejected the Lord. And they fall under His judgment. And Jesus says that if Tyre and Sidon would, would have gladly repented in sackcloth of ashes, if they would have seen what you see and hear what you hear, you see. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been remained, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So, to be able to reject Christ is the ultimate sin. To be able to reject Christ is what some theologians would call the sin against the Holy Spirit. 
that will not be forgiven. And we have to also uh, bring to everyone's attention that this, this sin of the Holy Spirit, uh, in order to properly understand it, uh, involves a finality, okay? Uh, so that uh, that sin against the Holy Spirit that isn't forgiven, uh, God gives us all the time that is necessary. God gives us all the ability and uh, he gives us every opportunity, but it will be limited. And at the end, when we ultimately reject him, is this, this, this harshness of judgment that we shall be faced with because even the, the heinous sinful cities of his day who were destroyed because of their sin would have repented, you see, in sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes was a traditional way of mourning. Uh, you know what sackcloth? Peter, you know what sackcloth is? Um, if, if you go to um, a uh, market and if you're purchasing a lot of potatoes that, what is it called, burlap? Bur uh, burlap? burlap? Yeah, burlap. That, that's sackcloth. Yeah, oh. So, you know, just take off all your clothes and put on oh. that burlap. That's comfortable. You see? Uh, it was a way of making you uncomfortable. It was a way of kind of punishing oneself, you see. Uh, it was a way of negating any kind of luxury that was a part of our life. It was a sign of sincere repentance. And not only uh, was uh, the wearing of this sackcloth, uh, burlap, uh, to use uh, this terminology, but one took no care in your physical appearance. Uh, you eliminated any vanity. There's no makeup. You didn't comb your hair. Uh, you didn't brush your teeth. You didn't wash your face. Uh, but instead, you would put ashes uh, and dirt in your hair and on your face. Uh, in fact, uh, many times, uh, uh, if you have ever seen uh, in movies uh, people mourning and so forth, uh, there are many customs where they would take dirt and even throw it up in the air and scream and holler and, and so this, this very dramatic uh, type of uh, action being taken to express that inner turmoil and sorrow. Uh, this is what it means uh, when we say we're covered in sackcloth and we cover ourselves in ashes. Ultimately ashes are symbolic of uh, what actually we are, you know, in the Western Church. They begin the uh, Lenten season called Ash Wednesday, mm -hmm. and uh, they take the ashes, and I think they're from the palm branches mm -hmm. from uh, the previous uh, Palm Sunday, mm -hmm. and uh, they take this, and as they are anointed, ashes you are, and ashes you shall return. Mm -hmm. It was a sign of repentance, uh, actually uh, reminding yourself uh, we're we're nothing but dirt. Without God, we are reduced to the prime element. We are nothing. It is God's breath that gives us life. Uh, I like very much the psalm we read at every Vesper service, uh, where it says, uh, the Lord opens his hand, we are fed. If he takes it away, we're dismayed. You see? Uh, if uh, he gives breath, there is life. If he takes breath, we return to the dust. It's a beautiful song. And that's why we read it every Vesper service. Uh, this same kind of imagery, you see, that we are nothing. Uh, and, and the greatness and power and prestige and recognition and, and money and all these things that we receive are nothing compared to the majesty of God. Let's continue on. At that time, Jesus answered and said, he offers a prayer, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent 
and have revealed them to babies. Even so, Father, for it seemed it, so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What, what powerful imagery. What powerful imagery. In this prayer, our Lord gives thanks to his Father, to God, the Lord of heaven and earth, that he has hidden these things from the wise and prudent. What's he talking about? He has hidden these, this, this gospel. He has hidden uh, the truth of the miracles and the power that they possess because of their arrogance and because of their unwillingness to, to believe. It, it is only those who possess faith that are able to perceive the truth of his teaching and to see the miracles and to give glory to God. And the holy things are not for those who are unholy. Remember before when we talked about the, pig and, uh, the pigs and the pearls? Okay. The same type of thinking is going on. And it is not hiding something so that everyone won't be saved. That's not what is being said here. What is said here is that truly, as we say in the liturgy, holy things are for the holy. Okay? And only those who love, only those who repent, only those who accept in faith the Lord are able to understand and see His teaching and His miracles. And the Lord rejoices because of that. Because the unfaithful do nothing but mock and ridicule and degrade and you know, I, I, I think there's one more dimension that we have to understand to this. That some kind, sometimes that mocking and derating causes people who have, say, a little faith to lose that faith. See? You could be caught up in this type of thing very easily if we are not strong enough to overcome it. So... Maybe this is another reason why the Father has chosen to hide these things, you see. And there are people who have ears, but choose not to hear, to not to understand, not to accept. I remember in my first parish, there was a parishioner who was giving me a really difficult time because he said that I was making something up, a new rule. And I told him, it is not me, it's in the Bible. And I told him where and, and so forth. And, and I, I, he was in my office and I, and I brought out my, my, my Bible and I opened to the page and I showed him. And he says, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. <laughs> see? <laughs> You see what I'm trying to talk about? You see, I don't want to see it. You know, I don't want to explore. I don't want to read other books. A lot of times, when when people are troubled with faith or or, or ask for some faith, I always ask, well, have you prayed about it? Have you read? You see, have you asked a, a priest a question? Have you talked to someone? You know, if you do nothing, 
you'll get nothing. And the Lord says, as you sow, you reap. You see? So, you, you see, uh, God has hidden these things from those who are not willing to accept because of the hardness of their heart. We use, we heard that terminology a lot of times in the Old Testament. Uh, and so that, that even those who are weak in their faith will not lose that faith. Okay? He says, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father, uh, knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. No one knows God except the Son of God. And through his preaching and through his ministry, what happens is that Jesus actually makes known the true identity of God. Okay? There is no ambiguity that we are able to see and understand who God is. And we're able to even enter into a relationship with Him. In the Gospel of John, in the High Priestly Prayer, as uh, it is referred to by many uh, of our theologians, uh, our Lord again talks about that reality. That uh, it is Jesus who makes known uh, the glory of the Father. And uh, anyone who does not accept the Son does not accept the Father. Because the Son only do, does what He sees the Father doing. His sole purpose is to do the will of the Father. Because the Father and the Son are one. You see? So, uh, therefore, uh, if you are to truly know God, it is only through the Son. St. Paul said it another way. He says, there's only one mediator between God and man. That is Jesus Christ. Okay? He is the only one who makes God known. There are not parts of God that are found other places, in other philosophies. There is only one truth. There is only one gospel. And the one who preaches that gospel, that is Jesus Christ, is the one because of his knowledge of God. And also, too, to know according to biblical terminology literally means to know in the most intimate way possible spiritually physically mentally and so forth we get a glimpse of this knowing concept uh, from the Hebrew and uh, from the Greek when we go back to the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, it says that, that Adam knew his wife Eve, and they gave forth their son Cain. Okay? Uh, it, it implies a, a, an intimacy, and theologically, a oneness. See? A oneness. So that the only way we can be accessible to the Father is only through the Son, who makes him known. He says, Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. And I don't think there is a person alive or those who have gone before us who did not know what it was to labor heavily and to be at unrest we go in and out of this all the time we talk about this physically mentally, emotionally even literally I know many times being called to prisoners, to the bed of prisoners who are dying struggling to breathe See? and that labored breathing um, so that all who, who are labor and who are heavy burden, the only way by which we can find true rest. And what is it that we mean by this rest? We mean to be able to be at peace with, 
to be in harmony with. To find meaning with, you see, is only through the Lord. And if we come to Him when we are heavy laden, then He will give us rest. One of the most important things that we must learn as Orthodox Christians is that we must rely completely on the Lord. He is the source for all things, and He is all things. We have to remember what He told the disciples, without me you can do nothing. And, as I said before, over and over, and you'll keep hearing me say that too, uh, we are not only can we do nothing, but we are nothing. A dirt, clay, see? And when we come to that realization, we realize that by placing our complete trust on the Lord, we will be able to find strength. We will be able to find comfort in our lives. And until you do it, you really don't know what it feels like and what it is to completely trust Him, to put your whole weight on Him, to lean on Him. Because if anything that we do, what happens is, realistically, it is Christ doing it through us. This is Pauline theology. See? Well, we, we will see this everywhere in the writings of St. Paul. It is uh, the grace of Christ working through us and in us that is able to accomplish all things. It's not our own strength. It is not our own wisdom. It is He who fights the battle. It is He who has, like Paul says, who has given us the victory. You see? We cannot do it on our own. And, like he said before, unless you lose your life, you save it. Because if you try to find it, you're going to lose it. Only in losing yourself, in Him, will we find life. And we will, will we find strength. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am lowly of heart. What is a yoke? We're going to pick on Peter today. What's a yoke, Peter? Uh, is that in an egg? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you're right. A yoke is the center of an egg. Uh, but when we go out onto the, to, to a farm, we'll have to have Bubba take you to the farm. Uh, in days gone by, when animals were used as machines to plow fields and so forth, the yoke was a large wooden, uh, a large wooden uh, device that was placed over an oxen. There was a little nooch where the head would go, and it would be tied, and that would be the reins would be tied on that with the plow and so forth, and 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 that is what. Uh, the ox used to be able to plow the field. Okay, it was this cumbersome, burdensome, heavy device. Uh, if you ever went to watch farmers start digging, you know, in the in the in the spring, uh, a lot of times uh, that ground is very hard especially if you do not have enough moisture, whether it be from rain or snow or whatever, uh, it dries out. Uh, you know, if, if you're talking about manually doing it with an ox, you're talking about even a person having, having to put their weight on that still plow, you see, in order to till that field. And it was hard and it was cumbersome and, and you, you had when, when, when the oxen wore it, you were completely at the mercy of the one pulling the reins, the master. Okay? 
that is what a yoke was. And the Lord says, take my yoke. In fact, I, uh, I, I remember reading a sermon one time on this passage, and the theologian was talking about the yoke, uh, even referring it to the cross. That heavy burden that Christ takes on the cross. Uh, in the Western Church, uh, many times when you go into a Catholic Church, you find the, I think it's 14 stations of the cross, right, 14? And in three of them, you have Jesus following, following, following on the ground uh, because of the, the weight, because of his human weakness, that, as some say the loss of blood and, and the punishment, the severity of the punishment, and the weight of the cross falling, you see, this type of yoke, if you will. And uh, he is one who has taken the yoke upon himself and makes the burden light through the forgiveness of our sins and through the bestowing of grace, you see. And uh, this yoke, when it is associated with Jesus uh, and becomes his yoke, what happens is it is made lighter because of the freedom given to us by the Lord and the grace and strength given to us by the Lord. So that in actuality, it is the Lord who now becomes the yoke. And it is through His strength that we are able to find the work that is necessary for our salvation to be bearable because of Him, as St. Paul, because He has already won the victory. Ours is to share in that victory through that penitential suffering and that penitential discipline of prayer and fasting and sackcloth and ashes and all these other different things. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lonely in heart. Learn from him is good advice because he is the perfect example because he's the image of the Father. He is the perfect example of humility because he is in himself all that meekness is supposed to be and humility is supposed to be. And a lot of times we as Orthodox, ooh, we as, <laughs> we as Orthodox Christians um, think of meekness as being a, a, a weakling. No. Uh, being meek requires a certain determination and strength. Okay? Uh, Jesus is not saying that he is impotent or he is uh, unable or, or weakling or a sapling or whatever terminology, uh, but really he is strength. Okay? And if we place our yoke upon him, place our burden upon him, then we are able to carry. Ari, one of my favorite stories, and we're going to have to quick, uh, stop quickly, uh, but one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament is King Hezekiah. Yeah, I've told you this before. Uh, King Hezekiah was surrounded by the enemy, and uh, people in other areas were losing horrifically. They were losing these battles, and, and one of the things that enemy uh, captains and soldiers would do would be to mutilate and uh, kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, desecrate bodies and so forth, and uh, do these uh, uh, terrible atrocities in order to frighten uh, any opposition. And the king sent a letter to, uh, uh, to uh, him, and uh, he, in this letter, tells all these terrible things that the king is going to do to him and to his people. And we're, for the sake of brevity, I, I won't go into everything, but you, you can read it, uh, Hezekiah in the Old Testament. And uh, the Hezekiah is absolutely fearful and quakes in his soul. And the scripture tells us he goes to the temple, takes that letter, and lays it in front of the altar 
and prays to God for deliverance. And God hears the prayer. Okay? But I like that concept. And this is what is being said, talked about here. To lay that burden before the Lord. Because He will give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom and that which is necessary. Because He is gentle and lowly in heart. And in Him will we find rest for our soul. For my yoke is easy, and he says, my burden is light. Nothing that the Lord will ask of us in our life, nothing he will ask of us will be impossible. Because he himself will do it for us, and in us, and through us. And with that, we close the 11th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. When we come back uh, next week, we will begin chapter 12, verse 1, the Gospel of St. Matthew. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of this uh, study of the Holy Scripture, the Word of God. And I pray that it strengthens you in your faith, and, and uh, as a result, we can all grow in uh, the Lord and be strengthened and take uh, His yoke and burden upon ourselves because ultimately it's easy and light because he makes it that way and uh, we invite you to come back and join us to invite others to come and be a part of our bible study if you have questions uh, you can uh, write them i will do my best to answer them and uh, we would be more than happy to have all of you a part of that so therefore uh, we will now uh, offer the prayer uh, to the Holy Mother of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. You are truly deserving of glory, O birth giver of God, the ever blessed and most pure Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim who as a virgin gave birth to God the Word, true birth giver of God, we magnify In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God.